Hi, this is the start of video two and computer number two because the first computer made a really terrible recording that took forever to upload. So let's try this. <clears throat> All right, so the principles of assessment in school age. So this is taken from the Language and Literacy Connections textbook, chapter five, which wasn't assigned, but um, but I particularly like this, uh, these five um, thought provoking uh, aspects of assessment. So avoiding the teach to the test trap. So uh, this that is where um, uh, assessment is uh, is directly based on what was being done uh, in the intervention uh, or in the the classroom. And uh, and so this uh, teach to the test is going to give you a false indicator of progress uh, given that the, uh, the, the, the stimuli or very similar stimuli were taught explicitly. And so the child learned to do those items, but not necessarily the task itself. Um, <clears throat> also stay focused on language behaviors that matter. Uh, so what language abilities underlie school success? So focusing on, on that functionality in the classroom and, uh, uh, and looking for uh, those things that are going to have the broadest uh, and most productive impact on children's functionality in the classroom. So your assessment choices should be aligned with the referral concerns uh, and, and the initial screening, the universal screening, uh, but also uh, include uh, probable curricular difficulties related to those issues uh, from the assessment and, uh, and initial screening. So find ways to evaluate the stability of uh, the student's language under conditions that push their language beyond the surface performance in one-on-one -on -one situations. So we know that for school-age children, oftentimes their language can sound quite perfectly fine. Um, but when uh, taking a closer look, they're using very simple vocabulary over and over again, and they're also using very simple syntactic structures. So, um, so what could be uh, misconstrued as the child is, you know, his, his language is fine, uh, you know, one has to kind of push them uh, to, to challenge the higher levels of language uh, abilities. So that being um, more complex uh, uh, tasks, such as uh, creating a persuasive argument, would be uh, more demanding than, say, for example, uh, a, a personal narrative, asking them to tell uh, about their birthday, um, that uh, there may be uh, greater demands uh, with depending on the age of the student and their abilities. Integrate written language into all assessment and intervention planning. Um, uh, you want to make sure that you're capturing uh, the linguistic comprehension uh, based on their oral language abilities, but you also want to look at their written language abilities. And then remember that language learning difficulties reside both within and outside of the student. Um, and so looking at some of those conditions, uh, as well as the student's individual ability, but looking at some of the uh, circumstances that um, uh, challenge their uh, functionality, their communicative functionality. So your assessment should be thorough, it should include a variety of assessment modalities, be valid and reliable, and tailored to the individual student and their needs. Uh, so certainly that includes the curricular needs because of course, um, if, uh, it, you know, in looking at how they're functioning in the classroom, it needs to align with the demands of the classroom. Uh, both for the, the hidden curriculum as well as the actual curriculum. Your assessment uh, has multiple sources of information, so your original uh, referral information. It should include strengths as well, hopefully, uh, to be able to give you some opportunities to anchor your assessment to uh, those abilities that the student uh, is um, you know, doing well in, <clears throat> and also their interests and that sort of thing. Also, uh, it should um, uh, identify what the concerns are um, and uh, how these impact the student's functionality in the classroom. Their case history, uh, being able to uh, access as much information as you can. Previous assessments that have been done, uh, including report cards and, and written samples of their work, such as tests and, and uh, written materials. 
direct observation uh, that you can observe. And ideally, it would be the context that prompted the referral in the first place. And so if it was being it was something that was being seen in the science classroom because of the higher, uh, you know, the tier three vocabulary related to science, then, uh, you know, to the for the best of your ability, being able to assess, uh, observe in that uh, atmosphere. Um, and then uh, and then also informal informal assessment as means of observation and interviews. So uh, your sources of information are going to come from uh, you know many different uh, um, aspects of your assessment, and ultimately your goal is to draw conclusions about a student's communicative functioning in the classroom and in school. Um, <clears throat> so I, I put together this uh, diagram that uh, to be able to give you a, a sense of the uh, the ability. Um, so take a look at this. So here we have the different elements that would be included. Now, of course, an oral exam would be included in this as well. Uh, all of the typical aspects of assessment uh, and um, and these in particular drawing from multiple sources of information uh, outside of the child that um, give you uh, information related to functionality. And then of course your diagnostic criteria often comes from formal testing, uh, that being standardized tests. In many schools they're using uh, the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals five um, for their diagnostic criteria. In kindergarten it may be P3. Um, and so uh, depending on where you go to work, that could vary, but um, uh, oftentimes eligibility for funding is dependent on uh, scoring below a certain identified score um, for uh, on, on those measures that are included in the battery. All right. And then your clinical decision based on the synthesis of all this information. Um, and you're going to uh, uh, propose your prognosis, your clinical priorities, uh, curriculum-based priorities, uh, as well as your participation on the IPP team and your contribution there. Uh, it, parent uh, information for the parent as well as counseling and any additional testing that will inform your next steps and referrals that would augment uh, your uh, support and your clinical involvement. Additional considerations would be what service delivery model and method would be ideal for the based on the student's needs. Uh, determining responsiveness to those and then uh, dosage uh, how how much um, uh, intervention is required in terms of the level of intensity that is necessary to uh, to have that child benefit, um, and then your caseload management and scheduling um, uh, routines that are used by the administration uh, will make a difference in terms of being having uh, a broader array of um, uh, opportunities, different ways that you can uh, provide intervention in moving forward. So norm reference tests, you've been talking about this in 530 as well as in 511. Um, so we won't go into this, uh, but, but just making sure that you're familiar with um, the uh, norm referenced, how the norm reference tests work. Uh, like, as I said, the cutoffs are usually determined by the administration. So whether that's 1.5 standard deviations or two standard deviations below the mean, um, it, it really differs across areas. So uh, being, making sure that you're familiar with how this, uh, this chart works. And then your standardized tests, there's, uh, um, it, it, it needs to be part of your assessment, like I said, obviously, because it, it often is related to uh, funding eligibility uh, for services. Um, and of course, it's administered in a standardized manner. So you don't have, um, uh, if you need to, if you want to use the norm reference scores, the standard scores, then uh, you'll need to administer it in adherence to the manual. Um, and uh, now some people may use stimuli uh, as a way of uh, probing students' ability, but that's ill-advised because you may want to use that measure later and then you've run into an issue of teach to the test. So, but use the, you can use the stimuli to identify similar, so let's say it's um, present progressive ing, 
um, that you may uh, be able to um, uh, look at those, uh, probe those further, uh, but don't use the same stimuli as what is in the standardized test. <clears throat> Your, um, uh, so it, often the standardized tests are sufficient to identify risk, uh, but not by themselves. Uh, you need a broader array and a more rich, uh, ec ecologically valid, meaning that it has, it's naturalistic. It's related to uh, children's functionality. Um, so, and that should be in form content and use as well as expressive and receptive language. Um, so, uh, learning related language and literacy skills. So the precursors or the peripheral skills related to oral and written language. For example, the uh, phonological awareness or phonemic awareness the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, or CTOP, as we refer to it. <clears throat> I did a study with Chris Lonigan, uh, looking at a very large sample of children from pre-K to grade 5, and, uh, and looking at uh, uh, how many factors are associated with many of these common measures that are used in speech-language pathology practice, how many, uh, in, in a large sample, I believe it was 1,863 uh, kiddos, that um, in that sample that um, we had children from uh, a good, a decent size sample from uh, all seven grades. And basically in typically developing children, we were able to demonstrate that, that of all those measures, including the ones that are supposed to measure listening comprehension or morphological com comprehension, uh, that then in fact, they were all measuring just two things, vocabulary and syntax. So these are the core abilities uh, for typically developing children and where we might see that uh, for children who have language learning difficulties, we, uh, we expect that uh, they may not have, their language may not be made up primarily of two core uh, factors or two core constructs of ability. Uh, theirs may be more than that, given that, uh, given that they're, they're uh, atypical development. So, but, but as I said, these, these measures in, in typically developing kiddos are all measuring the same thing. And this is done with a, a complex statistical analysis. Assessment, um, so uh, also criterion-based measures. So these measures are not norm-referenced. Uh, um, uh, they support instructional focus uh, and children's proficiency uh, is, is measured against a predetermined criteria or learning expectations based on uh, the stage of education. So often they're grade uh, leveled. Um, and for example, the leveled reading passages of the qualitative reading inventory, uh, the sixth edition, where children are provided with a, a reading, uh, connected text reading, but also wordless from that connected text. And so that you're able to establish uh, both their word reading and isolation ability, as well as their ability to read and connective text. text. Um, and then you can uh, ask them comprehension questions related to what they read uh, that allow them, allow you to tap into their reading comprehension. So as you can see, they can be really helpful in terms of informing your intervention targets and supports, uh, but they're, uh, they're not norm referenced and so they're not typically used in relation to uh, identification of children el children's eligibility for services, but you may find them very helpful. And you'll see we'll use the QRI-6 uh, in, in an upcoming lab. Then we have the, the distinction between uh, the, the static assessment as well as dynamic assessment. So you can take a look at those and you can see that there is a, a big dis distinction. Largely the dynamic assessment, I'm not sure how much of this you've talked about in, um, in, in your 530 class, but uh, dynamic assessment um, allowing you to, uh, to probe further uh, and, and teach the child how to perform the task uh, and, then, uh, and then test again. Um, and so it can be really informative in terms of uh, children's readiness for a particular skill. Uh, and, um, and so I'll let you uh, become familiar with those. And then uh, we, of course, uh, promote and endorse language sample analysis for both oral and written language. 
Um, and we have seen that uh, children's, um, this of course is measuring children's expressive language, uh, whether it's oral or written. Uh, and there are a number of um, uh, different things that 